pretty fast and into a different subject than I think we're, we're used to with engineering folks. Any questions about that? Um, I haven't gotten his presentation yet to post on the web, um, so it will come, hopefully. Um, I, and it, it should be there. Uh, so this week's speaker is Mr. Mark Truscott. I think everybody, if you've been in the LDA for very long at all, you know uh, Mark. He's going to be. Uh, he's been around for quite a while. Very active with our with our program. A member of the board, the advisory board. Thank you. We're going to be teaching. I hear what you said. Uh, just just one another lecture. Okay. I'm, I'm becoming over saturated here. I need to go away from that. But uh, Mark uh, has uh, kindly agreed to to share with us some of his projects in the Sacramento area. Um, talking about renewable real-world projects that respond to sustainable water practice. And he has a special guest, too, that you'll hear. Oh, yeah. Anyways, today I'm going to share with you some real-world practices that are in the industry today that we're actually using in the offices, and specifically within our office, Quadriga Landscape Architecture and Planning. We have an office in Sacramento, we have an office in Santa Rosa, and we do work all over Northern California. Anyways, um, landscape architecture, the practice of landscape architecture is evolving, and that's really, really exciting for me. It's been practicing for almost 30 years. The green design field is growing and changing daily. I think most of you have heard green, sustainable, that's really prevalent in the industry, which is really, really exciting for us landscape architects because for years, We've been like hammering sustainability, green, nature, ecology. These are good things. Finally, our civil engineering friends and architectural friends, they're all jumping on board with us. And the new technologies and products that are coming into the marketplace and the innovative designs are proving to be very, very effective. Um, today I'm going to touch on these three items. And in addition to the water efficient landscape ordinance, which you've heard some of you speak about, um, the next three programs are greatly influencing how we're practicing the, the traditional landscape architectural offices. The first one I want to talk about is LEED. How many people have heard of LEED? Many of you have. Right now, version three is out. It was released in 2009, and it's administered by the United States Green Building Council, which is a nonprofit group. And the LEED program certifies projects, silver, gold, platinum awards, and, cert and a certified project. Um, within LEED, there's a lot of paperwork that needs to be submitted. And on our projects that we work on, we actually spend a lot of time. And, and in many cases, a line item in our proposals are for LEED certification. There's a lot of time for the paperwork and, and certifying the project. Many of the new projects for universities and public agencies have requirements to be LEED certified. Here on campus, I believe silver is a must for every new project. And of the projects we worked on on the campus, the new Health Health Wellness Center, the project we worked on, uh, they're going for a LEED Gold certification. Um, there are 110 possible points from everything from construction activity pollution prevention to green power. And a majority of the points within LEED for the new construction rating um, are for building systems, which kind of leaves us out. There are very few points available for landscape, landscape issues. And um, of those landscape issues, uh, a majority are for stormwater design and water efficient landscapes. Um, a couple other things about LEED before I talk about the Sustainable Sites Initiative. Um, right in October, there was a class action suit brought against US GDC concerning the LEED program. Uh, there's, there are con there's concerns about monopoly and, um, and other issues. So it's actually kind of throwing a little bit of a wrench into the credibility of the LEED program. Although I haven't personally noticed us slowing down from seeking uh, 
certified projects or projects that are equivalent to certified projects. Um, but it's going to be really interesting in the marketplace to see how it all shapes out, uh, to see how a lead evolves and changes. And um, in general, I believe that it's been a good program because it's, it's put light on you know, sustainable design, especially to the builders, the contractors, our clients, the architects, the engineers. They're all on board now, which makes, I think, in a lot of cases, our job as landscape architects, as developers of site, and site systems and ecology, a lot easier. Sustainable, sustainable Sites Initiative is, um, was developed by the American Society of Landscape Architects, the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center, as well as the United States Botanical uh, Garden. And it is a holistic site guidelines and performance benchmark standard for site selection, planning, water, soils, um, materials, human well-being, construction, and maintenance. It's a, it's a great, great program that, um, that we as landscape architects, I think it's more in tune with what we do. Within sustainable sites, there are 250 points in the rating system, and it's very similar to LEED. Uh, the projects are rated one star to four stars, stars, excuse me. And of the total points, 44 are for site issues, site water issues, excuse me, which is about 18 percent, which is a, a lot better than the LEED program, which is very minimal. And there, there have been a lot of rumors as they've been developing this that this program will eventually fold into the LEED program from USGBC and that projects that are site, site projects, like parks and the projects that we take the LEED in, will be able to be certified in the projects and they're going to use this as a framework. And if you get into this, you'll see that it's structured very similarly to the LEED program. The third um, set of guidelines that are out in the marketplace right now, river friendly landscape guidelines. This is specific to the Sacramento Valley area and it's based on the Bay Friendly uh, guidelines. As a matter of fact, it's, it's a rewrite to the Bay Friendly for the Sacramento Valley. Um, and it was developed by the Sacramento Stormwater Quality Partnership. And um, it is, in most cases, uh, probably the best for residential projects and small commercial. It does not have a, a rating or certification program, but really it sets up a really nice set of, of guidelines and checklists uh, to, to landscape locally, less to the landfill, nurturing the soils, conserve water, conserve energy. These are, these are um, issues that are presented very um, <coughs> Very straightforward, very much for the homeowner, for the, the contractors to utilize. So we in our practice don't see a lot of use for this set of guidelines, but occasionally we do work on projects where there is a desire, and it's also very good for all of you to become aware with it. Time for a pop quiz. <coughs> the nice thing about my pop quizzes is I get prizes. So. <coughs> Anybody guess on this one? What percentage of total points are available for sustainable site water practices within the lead? New construction. Pardon? 14. Any other guesses? <coughs> Pardon? Five. Five is it. Winner. Five percent. And as you, as I mentioned before, I think 16 percent um, was for sustainable sites, but only five is for lead. <laughs> I'd like to now show a, um, a uh, video uh, that was produced by an American Society of Landscape <coughs> Architects that briefly goes over some of the best practices that are, we're actually doing in the offices now, which is really cool. What's important to realize, though, is that on many of our projects, we'll do like a bit or a piece or a couple things 
of what they're talking about. So let's see if the technology works from here. <clears throat> An aquifer is a below-ground natural reservoir of water that we use for drinking, cooking, bathing, and irrigation. The animation will demonstrate how rainwater is managed on a university campus plaza. The plaza surfaces are composed of standard materials. Concrete defines the walks and steps, and sod and lawn make up the open space. The building's roof, which also collects and discharges water, is a plain solid surface. Storm sewer and drains are ready to catch and pipe water away from the site and prevent flooding. During heavy rainfall, these materials, like concrete and sod, can only absorb so much water. The excess rainwater on the surface is funneled into the storm sewers. The building's roof diverts most of its water down pipes into storm drains as well. All this excess water, called runoff, can overtax and cause the storm drains to back up. This causes water to collect in ever-expanding pools. Too much runoff due to heavy rains can cause damage and sometimes catastrophic floods. It also results in more polluted, untreated water entering the aquifer. There are more effective means to manage stormwater using sustainable systems and materials that prevent flooding and replenish the aquifer. The first system is a green roof placed on top of a building. The green roof is layered with drainage materials, compost or planting soils, and vegetation. The green roof can absorb some of the rainfall, reducing the amount of water flowing into the storm drains. Another system involves porous pavement. Concrete surfaces are replaced with individual concrete bricks called pavers. Each paver is interlocked with its neighbor and separated by permeable material. The permeable material is composed of small crushed rocks, also called aggregates. Zooming into the cross-section, we see the permeable aggregates between and below the pavers. The aggregate-filled space acts as a sponge, absorbing water downward, diverting a good amount of runoff from the storm drains. The diverted water will eventually make its way into the aquifer below ground. The third system is called bioretention and is also known as a rain garden. A rain garden is a swaler channel that absorbs, holds, and slowly releases excess water. A rain garden section is composed of compacted soils defining the depth, width, and slope of the swale. Sand and drainage materials, plant soils, and vegetation native to the region. Rain gardens are not only aesthetically pleasing, they also restore wildlife habitat. Now when it rains, water does not collect into large pools. Instead, our three systems absorb and redirect the excess runoff. The green roof prevents a lot of water from entering the storm system or hitting the ground. The porous concrete pavers absorb some of the rainwater and direct it downward into the aquifer. And the rain garden accumulates the remainder of the rainwater, preventing flooding and damage. As part of its function, the rain garden slowly releases rainwater into the aquifer over a 24-hour period. Just as important, the vegetation acts as a natural water purifier, absorbing pollutants and toxins from the water. Water is in high demand and shortages are common. These three systems are able to capture and treat more water than typical stormwater mechanisms. The systems are effective, easy to implement, and contribute to a more sustainable water management practice. Interesting little video. Um, what's interesting for us is that we worked on the first green roof here at UC Davis. It's a little, I don't know if any of you have seen it, but the new health and wellness center on the third floor above the entry is a little postage stamp size green roof. And um, it's really neat to work on the first one. And hopefully there'll be many, many, many more in the years to come. Another note is, um, that just 10 years ago, uh, a lot of those concepts weren't even on the drawing board. We did not have the opportunity to do all those, with the exception of uh, special projects that were you know, really forward thinking um, owners, architects, engineers who really wanted to push the envelope. It's just within the last 10 years, a lot of those concepts that you saw in the video have come into the mainstay. And as I mentioned, oftentimes in our projects, 
we get to use a couple of those concepts, coupled together, and it makes our work, I think, a lot more exciting. So right now I'm going to look at some case studies that implement these stormwater and urban water issues. And the first one is a project I visited in July in New York City, which is the Highline Park Project. And I think many of you have seen photographs of it. And I, I highly recommend if you get a chance to go to New York City, make sure you get to Greenwich Village and take a look at this project. It's a 20 block um, urban park project. And for many, many years, archaeologists, urban archaeologists, archaeologists and naturalists would climb up the top of this abandoned railway. And they'd hang out up there. The sanitation uh, would fill into the cracks. And, and, and local indigenous plant material would pop up. And it's, they spent a lot of time in research, researching the materials that were going out there. And they used a specially designed concrete mix that's designed to last a long time so that they wouldn't have to expend the energy and the cost to replace you know, the members because a lot of it, the, uh, the paving systems are precast, special precast systems that float on stainless steel spacers. And then underneath it, you see a metal tray which collects the rainwater and precipitation. And, um, and in many parts of the High Line, the water is recirculated and used. And in the future, they plan on harvesting rainwater from adjacent buildings to use it to irrigate the plant material. The plants throughout the project are native indigenous drought resistant species that are tailored to the microclimate of the elevated 30 feet in the air highland project. And the views are outstanding. It's incredible. After you've spent hours walking the streets of New York City with all the activity, all the visual clutter and jostling with people to get up and move for blocks in this beautiful green garden with views of the Hudson River and, and other view corridors that are just incredible. And in essence, you're floating above the streets in New York City in a linear green oasis. So I, I really, really recommend you get up there and take a look. And as they're building, <coughs> you get the opportunity to see how they cracked open the skin and look underneath as, as, as landscape architecture, or student of landscape architecture, and see how they put things together. It's wonderful. Now I'd like to introduce my special guest, uh, <coughs> Christy Mack. Talbot, who was an LDA grad from 1999, landscape architect at Quadriga, and she's going to talk about a project she's working on at Quadriga right now. Justine? Okay. Oh, okay. I'm going to try not to start coughing again. But um, yeah, I'm a graduate from UC Davis 1999. I've been working at Quadriga for three or four years now and worked elsewhere for years before that. And this particular project is a project we've been working on for about three years. And um, the engineer and the architect have been working on it a few years before we started. So it's a long term project. It's a hospital campus in Santa Rosa, California. And it's a 23 acre site that shares space with the Wells Fargo Center, which is a performing arts center in San Francisco. So access to that performing arts center has to be maintained. <clears throat> now, as you can imagine, through this three-year process, there's been lots of changes to the plan. And it looks like a big parking lot, but it has to accommodate a lot of stormwater quality um, provisions and also provide uh, quality of life to people that are going to be visiting the hospital, visiting patients, maybe workers that are there 12 hours a day. You know, they're going to need places to walk on the site that they can get away from the stress of being in the hospital. So although in this plan view it looks like a lot of parking, which it is, we work very hard with the civil engineer to um, make the ground spaces very accommodating and more generous than you would normally find in a parking lot. Um, this is an aerial view, and you can see 
surrounding the site is agricultural land to the west and to the south. And then to the east and the north, the residential is starting to encroach. So there was a lot of concern from the neighbors about, you know, the impact that this site and paving the site specifically would have on the local streams, Santa Rosa and Sonoma County in, in particular, they have a lot of naturalized streams. Unfortunately, our site, we have channelized streams and a lot of culverts, but we still have to think about how we're impacting all those folks downstream of our stormwater. Because the site is 23 <coughs> acres, I think I said, um, most of it currently is greenfield. So two-thirds of the site is agricultural land, so it absorbs a lot of water naturally. Well, we're going to be paving over all but five acres of that. So five acres of landscape needs to absorb, what, 18 acres of runoff. So that's one of our challenges. <clears throat> this graphic is something that we coordinated with the civil engineer on the site. We were so lucky in this project because the civil engineering company we're working with is very forward thinking and they're interested in finding new ways to um, make the site better, which is great. So we got to work together and come up with a system of stormwater management. Um, the kind of yellow-green depicts vegetated swales. That weird mustard brown depicts detention basins towards the south, which were existing and were just improving. And then the green uh, depicts just general landscape areas that we can accommodate stormwater. Um, we have bioretention areas on site, and these are fairly large, generous planting areas within the parking lot, like I think that's 30 to 40 feet across, which you generally don't see planting areas that large in the parking lot, so it's pretty forward thinking for our client to accommodate the cost and the space required for the stormwater management. They are required by law <laughs> to meet um, stormwater retention on site, so they have a lot of reason to um, make that happen. But they've been very open-minded to our uh, recommendations for plantings and how to maintain the water on site. Maybe I'll just, um, I don't know if you can see the dashed line that's kind of grayish on the inside of the triangle. That area is going to be um, a retention area, so it goes down four or five feet with gravel, so the water will soak into the top foot of soil and then be stored on site and can go back into the groundwater. And this is a, a section of that area. So the bioretention area would be planted with uh, native plants and low water using plants that can accommodate winter inundation, but also survive on low water because we don't want to over irrigate. And um, this little drawing is similar to what we're proposing as far as the stormwater storage in those retention areas. And that image is just kind of an inspiration image that we used when we were developing our plans. The vegetated swale areas in the parking lot all uh, receive water runoff from the adjacent parking. So they need to look good year-round because it's a hospital that has an owner that's interested in maintaining a certain uh, image. They don't want a bunch of scrubby looking plants in their parking lot. But it also needs to be low water use and it needs to accommodate slowing of the water to allow for uh, velocity slowing so that the downstream storm drains don't get blocked up in a big storm event. And um, I think it also assists in uh, removing small particles and oils and that kind of thing from the parking lot runoff. And again, these are pretty generous. These are minimum 16 feet across. So for a parking lot island, that's very, very generous. Did you, you have a question? Yeah, do you do, you do that without a curb? That's so correct. Right, so all the water, I have a section. 
So the adjacent parking areas, there's no curbing. The water runs off the pavement and into these swales and is carried downstream to some of the other bioretention areas and or to the uh, on-site swales. So we, we looked at a lot of different grass mixes because we wanted it to look good year-round. We wanted it to accommodate being inundated at various times of the year, but we didn't want to have to irrigate it all the time. So we worked with a local sod farm who has a great variety of these native sod mixes that they now produce just for this very, very application. And uh, five years ago, that didn't happen. You know, so this is a, a great movement forward. Um, so this image to the left here, that's kind of the look we were going for. We didn't want it to be super maintained. We wanted it to look a little wild, but still look interesting and good, just like the uh, adjacent landscapes in Sonoma. Sonoma County is very forward thinking in their um, design and what they interpret to be a garden. So this kind of thing will work in Sonoma. That center image is, uh, I think that's limus grass, which is a very popular grass to use in bioretention swales because it can take a lot of water, it can take little water, and it, I think it pulls some of the heavy metals from the runoff. And I like the third picture because I love irises, so we're going to have some irises on our swales. This is kind of some imagery that we pulled when we first were getting inspiration on what these swales would look like. And then we realized we're not Seattle. So, you know, the standard kind of grassy <coughs> swale is not going to work for us in the valley, even on the coast. We have soils that are heavy in clay, so they don't drain quickly. We have to irrigate heavily in the summer, which is not acceptable anymore. And so we need to come up with a new way to do this because rain gardens and bioswales and bioretention, as I'm sure you've been hearing, are how we're going to be dealing with stormwater on site. And um, yes? I was wondering what the name of the uh, farm or where the place you said you got your grasses from. You know, I was just trying to think of that. What is the Don't dumpling Don't grass. And they will give you a tour, and they've been doing research on these sods. Um, you guys are probably all familiar with the transpiration and the amount of rain that's, or inches of, of water that's required to sustain plant life. They've gotten some of these sods down to 3.3 of required evapotranspiration. So it's normal grass is like 80% or something. So it's a, it's a big savings. Um, so we're looking at new ways to, to plant these things because it's going to be part of our future. I wanted to go back to this plan just to kind of talk again about, you know, technology and new thinking and how lucky we are when we're in college because it's just part of our vernacular. You know, you guys are hearing all these terms, lead and sustainability and uh, bioretention and all these different types of uh, ways to deal with the landscape sustainably. But out in the world that we work in, it's not second nature. You know, you have to pull your client kicking and screaming sometimes. And a lot of these technologies are just now being implemented in things like parking lots, and places that are not publicly owned buildings. So there's probably like a five to 10 year lag between when you're learning about something that's cutting edge in school and then when it's applied. So we're still learning how to maintain these things, how to deal with them, how to <coughs> encourage our clients to do these things within their budget. And um, so it's kind of exciting. So I guess I wanted to show this graphic again just to show the areas on site that are going to be vegetated swales, that limey yellow. Those are going to be spray irrigated in, our, in this project. So those are the only areas that are going to have spray irrigation on this whole site. 
and where all those little strips. And they're going to be irrigated uh, with high efficiency, low precipitation rate heads called MP rotators. So they're going to be the most efficiently irrigated spray grass areas that we can do. The remainder of the site is all going to be subsurface drip irrigation, which I've never done a project this big that had subsurface drip irrigation. So it's amazing to me that our client is doing this and is uh, very good home. And part of the reason that they're doing it is because we had a law a year or two ago that requires all new projects to reduce their water use by 25%. So, you know, the legislation, the legislation, um, ordinances, state law, county law, all those types of ordinances help us to encourage our clients to do the right thing. When maybe in the past they would go a cheaper route. So, I think we're moving in the right direction. And this is just a little image showing you how that hydrozone table, this is a table that's required on all plants now as part of the low water use ordinance. So our site is 292,000 square feet. So 87.67% of our site is low water use plantings. That's amazing. You don't do that very often. So this is pretty unique. Um, moderate water use plant is only 12% of the site, and that's in the shaded areas of the site. So we feel pretty excited about this project. And uh, we're using the subsurface irrigation, just the, I'm sure you've seen that before. So that is the, that's Sutter Santa Rosa. Okay, I'm going to quickly run through one, one last project. One little note, too. Um, that Santa Rosa project, Sonoma County is using it as a case study to develop their stormwater guidelines. So actually, they don't have anything written. They're working with us to develop those guidelines. They're working with Christine and our team to develop the guidelines that in the future people will have to. Okay. And that gets just a few more minutes, though. Uh, 15. Oh. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> the last project I'm going to look at is Colonia St. Saint Martin. And it's a high-density housing project that we worked on for AIDS patients and their families. So socially, it's a really cool project. Now, before this site was 95% impervious asphalt parking lot. The project that you see here has 60 living units, and it's 68% impervious. So we've done well in terms of reducing the amount of paving. Uh, project objectives for this project was to really focus on stormwater quantity and quality, to reduce and treat the runoff, to involve the entire design team and the owner in designing an integrated stormwater solution that um, created natural, sustainable amenities for that fostered a community sense of well-being because of the target client that was going to live there. We want to create this really, really wonderful environment for the, the patients and their families. And also because it's affordable housing, we had to really, really be careful with costs. That was a real, real um, tricky endeavor. What we see here is the central green area, the only place where we have lawn for people to play, and then how it slopes down to a vegetative swell. Now, when we did this project, um, we didn't have the wonderful options that we have now through Delta Bluegrass with with grass mixes in sod that, uh, that are really incredibly wonderful in terms of diversity. So we used a Nomo hard fescue for our vegetative swells in this project. Here we see um, how the street runoff runs into the landscape where we broke down the curves and we pitched and moved the, the runoff off this, the private street and the parking areas into the vegetative swell, vegetative swell. Only 3% of the project, 3% of the impervious areas, pavement, uh, directly go into a stormwater system. So 97% of the site is moving through vegetative areas to clean and uh, before it is discharged. Uh, we just disconnected the downspouts, as you see, 
And so to move the water from the rooftops, which many of the rooftops have PV or photovoltaic energy producers, you know, we move the water, move them through our vegetated swells, and um, throughout the project we utilized a lot of uh, efficient, water efficient landscape plants. Um, one note, those two irrigation valves that you see, the boxes, they're in the bottom of the swell. That's not a good thing. So as you're designing your projects, we had them actually move those because if you think about it, the water's going to run, it's going to sit in that box which your irrigation valve is in, which isn't a good thing. The valve box gets full of water all the time when it sits in the water and it creates maintenance problems. So as you guys are working on your projects, make sure you make a note or show those, make a nice big note that irrigation valves are not to be in the middle of the swell line for, for water flow. Probably one of the coolest things about this project is the fact that we used a lot of edible plants and we created this community garden so that the people have really embraced these raised gardens that we designed. So we basically created raised gardens, brought the irrigation to it, filled it full of class A topsoil, and just walked away. And they've created their own sense of community, and they're growing their own beds, and it's really rallied up the community there. And it, it is a wonderful, wonderful asset to the projects that we work on to bring edibles into the landscape. And once again, five, 10 years ago, the concept, the thought of bringing edibles into the landscape it was very foreign, and oftentimes we, we met stiff arm because they didn't want to maintain. It was always a maintenance cost. We don't want to maintain. We don't want to have to spray trees. We don't want to. But now, more and more, it's um, it's a wonderful added feature that we get to play with. We bring more edibles into the landscape. One other note, too, is with the diversity of plant materials, we're able to bring more butterflies and bees and birds into the landscape. Whereas before, there was a lot of pressure on us as landscape architects to plant more maintenance-wise plant material that maybe didn't have the diversity in terms of flowers and that would bring the, the, uh, the birds and bees to our projects. So we're careful where we put the plants because we don't want people to walk by beehive well, but I think it's a wonderful thing for us to play more with just not, not the aesthetic of color, form, texture, but now scent and life, bringing life into our landscapes as we design. There are many variable components to what we do as practitioners, and many of these are, are mutual relationships that are in all of our projects, and it's just a really, really cool time practicing, and I think in the future it's going to be even better. I'm really, really excited. So I look forward to all of you joining us in creating wonderful uh, projects that deal with water in a more sensible way that's regional, regionally perspective. Because we aren't Seattle, we're Sacramento. We have our own issues, and in the years to come, I think we're going to create some really, really wonderful solutions. Thank you guys very much. Special guest. Did you just repeat the name of that last project for me? Colonia St. Martin. And it's uh, Florin Road, South Florin area. Florin Mall Road Drive. It's in South Sacramento area. And you would have to check in at the office because it's, it's dated. But feel free to go and say you're a student landscape architecture. And, and they're very kind. They'll probably walk around and show you the process. It's not a big project site. It's a very neat project. Actually, we won a stormwater award for the project, too. Any more questions? Yeah, I'd like to ask a question about the High Line project in New York. So, how long um, take for the design process and how many companies involved? You know, I, I, there were a handful of consultants. Uh, James Corner um, designed his, his office, did. The, the project. He had an architect um, uh, working with him, a whole big team of consultants. And they have a consulting plant uh, arborist and, uh, and horticulturist helping select the plants. The, it was a very community-based project. I believe that it took three years, three to four years, yeah. to go through the design. 
the, the design time, just the design time. Yeah. And then they went into construction documents, which I don't know the exact length, but I'm sure was at least 12 to 24 months. So probably six years it took kind of from start to finish. And there was a lot of community involvement at the very beginning to, to get the rights of that property turned over to the public realm. Yeah. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, so this the, um, the project is complete? The first phase of three is completed, uh, 20 blocks, which is a long way. And they're currently working on the next phase. I found my first slide showed they're starting to work on the second phase. And uh, when it's all done, it'll be a mile and a half long um, stretch of urban park that floats above New York City. Just a fabulous space. And there are, there are wonderful different spaces. It's not just all green garden. There are gathering spaces, there are amphitheater spaces that look over the street, plexiglass. You, you sit in the amphitheater and just watch the street scene. It's, it's wonderful. Performing spaces. Connections to adjacent buildings and living units. It's a fabulous place. So do you think that this would be a good example for other American cities to um, kind of renovate the, the vacant space? Yes, clearly. And I think that, that we should all be looking for opportunities to take what some may consider, consider derelict space that are brownfield in nature and take them to the public realm and renovate them for a public space and where we can bring the birds and the bees. That was one note also with this project. I don't know if I mentioned it. 30 feet up in the air, I was seeing birds and bees in the plant material, which was really cool because you don't get a lot of that in New York City. So, anyways. Lauren? Any more questions? Uh, you know, another project that I just visited this, this last summer was at the Arizona State, or University of Arizona, uh, their landscape architecture building. Mm -hmm. And if you've heard about that, they, they collect the, uh, it's, it's Arizona, so it's hot. So they collect all the rain, the air conditioning condensate, uh, the storm, they have summer monsoons, so they collect all that water, they use that for flushing the toilets, for, um, and they have a, 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 like a rain garden through the front of the building, and the vegetation changes because it goes between the buildings, so they put rain garden, desert type plants in the, beginning of an as it passes through the buildings that they switch to more canyon vegetation. Mm -hmm. It's really, really cool. Mm -hmm. Award-winning design too. Okay, any more questions? Just one other note, I think our future in the secondary gray water use is I'm pitching that. I think that's gonna be really important for what we do. And uh, we're looking for opportunities to use it. There are a lot of issues associated with health, but uh, I think <coughs> it's a challenge. In this area, semi-arid region, Use that gray water, put it in the landscape. All right, thank you very much. Thank you guys. Thank you.